I didn't have that kind of a life, and I wanted that kind of a life. But brothers and sisters, I know what it is today to live a life of overcoming. I haven't arrived yet. I haven't heard him say, well done yet. But brothers and sisters, I'm on my way. And I know what it is to live a life of defeat. But I also know what it is to live a life of victory and overcoming through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the life that God wants for each one of us, a life of overcoming. Yes, we face struggles. We're never going to be done facing struggles. We face hardships, difficulties. We do fail. But God wants in all of that, God's working in us to bring us to that place of a life that overcomes. Now, here in John, the 11th chapter, we know the account here. Lazarus was sick. And Mary and Martha, they send a message to him. And the message was very simple. They said, Lord, the one that you love is sick. Now, that spoke to me because I, as I looked at that, how are they coming to Jesus? The basis for them coming to Jesus, they didn't say, Lord, the one who loves you so much is sick. The one who so faithfully serves you is sick. But they came to Jesus based on the love that he had for them, based on the love that he had for Lazarus. That's how they came. And it's important that you and I love God, absolutely. But why do we love him this morning? Is it not because he first loved us and gave himself for us? And so that's why we love him is because he loved us. And so they come to Jesus, not based on, his, on, on the love of Lazarus, but based on the love of Christ. And they said, the one that you love is sick. And this is true. They, they weren't just making this up. Because it says in verse 5 that Jesus loved Martha. He loved Mary and he loved Lazarus very much. So this was true. But then verse 6 says, When he heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now in my mind and in many people's minds, if Jesus loves them and if Jesus cares for them, Jesus should have immediately, when he heard the news, should have rushed over to the house and taken care of the need. Isn't that how we think? If God loves me, if God loves me, why, why isn't he meeting my need? Why, why is he taking so long? But the fact that Jesus loved them, because he loved them, he tarried two days longer where he was. And brothers and sisters, you, I, don't know, I don't know you people. I, I know uh, many of your faces are familiar. Many of you are not. But I don't know what all you're facing and what all you're going through. You may be in the middle of something right now and you're wondering, God, if you really love me, why am I going through this? Why is this happening to me? But it could just be, and it may, may very well be, that the reason, the reason that you're in what you're in is because God loves you. We have that promise. It says we know. It doesn't say we understand. It says we know. There's some things in the Christian life that we need to know that needs to take us beyond just what we can understand. But we know that all things work together for good. For those who love God. For those who are the called according to His purpose. It doesn't say we understand it. But it says we know it. So it's something that needs to be settled in your heart and in my heart, and so Jesus loved him, and yet he tarried. And in, in my mind, so many times, I think if God loves me, he shouldn't tarry. He should come immediately and get me out of this, intervene somehow. But Jesus loved them, and because he loved them, he tarried. So finally... Lazarus dies. Jesus doesn't come. Lazarus dies. And, and there's so much in this that I'm uh, just skipping over. But Lazarus dies. And then finally, Jesus, when he does come, he's been, he finds out he's been in the grave for four days, and that's when Martha meets him. And she says, Lord, if you just would have been here, we had some hope. We had a little bit of hope if you just would have shown up. 
it would have been okay. And then Jesus says to her, he says, your brother is going to rise again. Then Martha, she says, I know. And then Martha quotes scripture to him. Martha knew her Bible. She says, I know, Lord. I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So Martha knew her Bible. Martha knew the truth. Martha knew the doctrine of the resurrection. She says, yes, Lord, I know that. And then Jesus says something to her. He says, I am the resurrection. In other words, Martha, you know the word. You know the doctrine of the resurrection. You know the truth. But I am that. It's not just a doctrine that you need to know. It's not just a truth that you need to know, but you need to realize that that's who I am. And brothers and sisters, it's very important for you and I to know that the Lord Jesus Christ you know, in, in the Old Covenant, when God gave the Old Covenant to the children of Israel, He gave them laws, He gave them commandments, He gave them sacrifices, He gave them offerings. But when, Jesus, when, when, when He wanted to bring in and to establish the New Covenant, it wasn't just better laws, it wasn't just better things. But in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, the Bible says, Sacrifice and offering, thou wouldest not, but a body... Hast thou prepared me? And so in bringing in the new covenant, gee, God did not just give us something more or something better. God gave us a person, and that person's name is Jesus Christ. And so Martha, she knows the word. And Jesus is saying, it's good, Martha. You know the word, but I am the word. And we need to see that. It's important for us to see that if you're going to live a life of overcoming, then you're going to have to see I'm going to have to see, we're going to have to see that truth is not just something that we know. Truth is not just a doctrine. Truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Holiness is not just a doctrine. Holiness is a person, and his name is Jesus. Sanctification is not just a doctrine that we need to know. It's a person. And his name is Jesus. And when we separate doctrines, when we separate things like that from who Jesus is, that's when we become religious. That's when we become religious. I appreciate what Steve said. You know, it's about, it's about my relationship with him. Do I love him? Am I walking with him? Am I communing with him? Am I in fellowship with him? Because if I go about if I take holiness and I, I put it in a box and I say, well, this is holiness. This is holiness. Look like this, talk like this, act like this, and you're holy. I've separated holiness from Christ, and then it becomes something of dead religion to me. But if I see holiness as not just a doctrine in Scripture, but holiness is a person... And if I walk with Christ, I live with, if I live for Him and I allow Him to live His life through me, I will be a holy person. I will walk in holiness. I will walk in the fear of God. Amen? Amen. We see the answer given to the churches in Revelation. Some of those churches were in bad shape. The description that is given there they were in bad shape how did God answer that to each one of those churches he came with a revelation of himself he came with a further revelation of who he was to the one church to them he was the one that held the seven stars in his hand to another church he was the one with those eyes as a flame of fire to another church he was to every church to, to answer the need that was there he came with the revelation of himself, a further revelation of who he is. Brothers and sisters, if there's something in my life, something in our life that isn't right, there's a need for me to see Jesus just a little bit more. There's a need for me to see who Christ is because when I see him, I'm not going to see everybody else's undoneness. Isaiah was in the presence of God 
And when he saw that and he experienced that and he heard that, he didn't just say, woe is the nation of Israel. He said, woe is me. Woe is me. And in the presence of God, that, that's what happens. You, you see, you know, in the presence of God, you see God and then you see how absolutely different I am from him. But I'm so thankful it doesn't bring you into a hopelessness. There's something that the grace of God and the Spirit of God does in the heart that you know He's doing something in there. He's making me more like Him. It's not hopeless. But there's hope, but it's only in Christ. And so we cannot separate these things from Christ because if we do, we end up creating something that's nothing more but religion and self-righteousness. Holiness, righteousness, truth. All of these things is not just a doctrine. It's a person. And what is his name? Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Amen. So Lazarus, Jesus raises him again. And one thing interesting that stood out to me in verse 38, when Jesus comes to the grave, I've read this many, many times. All of a sudden, one day I read this and I saw something I never saw before. It, it gives us a description of what the grave was. It says it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And I remember reading that and I remember thinking, well, why is that? I mean, he was dead and he was buried. Why is it important for the Bible to tell us what kind of grave it was? As I began thinking of that and began looking at that, God just all of a sudden began speaking to me. It was a cave and a stone was rolled in front of it. Why is that significant? Why is that important for us to know that? And then Jesus tells them, take the stone away. And then Martha immediately tells him, Lord, we can't do that. We can't do that because inside of this tomb, inside of this grave, there's a body that's been dead. And by this time, it's stinking. So, Lord, we actually, we need that stone there. We need that stone to stay there because it's protecting us from something. If you roll that stone away, that foul odor is going to come out. The stench is going to come out. It's ugly. It's horrible. And so we need to keep the stone there because it's protecting us from that. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was not asking them to raise Lazarus. He was going to do that. He was going to take care of what they could not do, but he said, you have to take away the stone. What was he saying? I believe he was saying, you have to give me access in order for me to be able to do what I want to do with this situation. And many times in our lives, brothers and sisters, we can have bitterness inside. We can have unforgiveness. We can have anger. We can have hatred. We can have all of these things inside. Jesus is not asking you by your own strength to somehow get rid of that. But he is saying, roll the stone away and give me access into that place of your life so that I can take care of it. But Martha immediately says, Lord, we can't do that because what's inside is going to come out and sometimes that's how we are. Lord, you can't, I can't let you in this area of my life because if I do, what's inside is going to come out. It's going to stink. It's foul. But Jesus says, no. I'm not offended by that. Jesus was not offended by that smell inside that tomb. Jesus did not run away from it. You notice Jesus' ministry and his life. He never ran away from a messy situation. Never. You know, there's, we, we have a lot of community people coming. They're, they're in our home church. And they come and they, and they have struggles and things that, that we're just not used to dealing with. We didn't grow up with some. We grew up with our own things. But these people come and sometimes the situation is messy. It's just messy. And there have been times I've been tempted to just say, you know, Maybe, maybe you could go somewhere else and find some help. And I was, I was that close to doing that one time to someone who came and just, they began pouring out, this is my life, this is who I was, this, this is my past. 
And I was very tempted to say, you know what? Inside, I was thinking, this is messy. Have you ever, have you ever faced that? This is messy. I'd just rather not deal with this. I'd rather just walk away. Jesus never, never walked away from a mess. Actually, he did. He did walk away from the religious mess. The sinful mess did not offend Jesus. The sinful mess did not offend Jesus, but the religious mess he sure did. He had something to say, strong words to that. But Jesus, you know, when they brought the woman of adultery, caught in adultery, they brought her, brought her to Jesus, said, Jesus, we caught her in the very act, and the law says stone her. Now, what are you going to do? You know, if it would have been me, I'd have said, you know, I'd rather not be, take her to the rabbi down the street. I'd rather not deal with this. This is messy. And Jesus was never afraid of a mess. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is not offended by your mess. And like I said, I don't know your lives today, and so I can preach with great freedom. You know, I, I, I was preaching one time in a church, and afterwards a lady was there, got mad, walked out. He was talking about me. You know, I think that's the greatest compliment you could ever give a preacher. Don't know anything about you, but I was talking about you. And so this morning, I'm here with great freedom. I don't know. I know you love God. I know you're born again. I know you're children of God, but I don't know your lives. I don't know the details, and I'm, I'm so happy not to. <laughs> but Jesus is not afraid or offended by your mess if you have one. He's not afraid of that. Jesus, you know, Jesus didn't say, well, let me walk downwind first and then you roll the stone away. No, he's, he's standing right there. Not offended. I mean, they roll the stone away. Imagine the stench. Jesus said, just give me access. I'm not asking you to raise Lazarus from the dead. I'll do that. And he's not asking you this morning to do what you can't do. He'll do that. But he needs the ac access into that place. And that is what you need to do. Roll the stone away. Let him into that place. Let him deal what he needs to deal with. And so then, finally, they do. They roll the stone away. And Jesus calls him, prays first, and he calls him, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, here he comes. Here he comes, out of that grave. He's bound up. I, I mean, he, he couldn't walk, couldn't stride out. But he's, I don't know how he came out of there, but he was bound up with grave clothes. Those clothes that he had on, when he came out of that grave, those clothes said that he was dead. But here he comes, alive, walking out of the tomb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you know, Jesus is not satisfied with him just being alive. There was something more that needed to be done for Lazarus. He was alive, he was living, he was breathing, he was walking as best he could. But Jesus was not satisfied. He said, when he came out of the grave, he said to those that were standing there, loose him and let him go. Those grave clothes don't belong on him anymore. Those grave clothes say that he's dead, but I've just raised him. They don't belong to him anymore. Loose him, let him go, take him off. And brothers and sisters, God is not just satisfied with you being born again, as wonderful as that is, as great as that is, that's awesome. But he's not satisfied with you just simply being born again. Jesus said in John 10, 10, he said, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So the fact that you're born again, that's awesome, that's wonderful. Rejoice and praise God. But God is not satisfied with you just being born again. He wants to give you a life that is abundant. And in that is the overcoming life, the victorious life that God has for each one of his children. And so Lazarus comes out, but Jesus is not satisfied to just leave him like that, like he is. He's alive. Yes, amen, praise God, hallelujah, he's no longer dead. But Jesus says those grave clothes got to come off. Because he's alive, but what kind of a life is it to be all bound up? 
He's alive, but there he is, can't hardly move. What kind of a life is that? Brothers and sisters, what kind of a life is it to, yes, be born again, be a child of God, and yet be bound up with unforgiveness or bitterness or anger or lust or covetousness? What kind of a life is that? That's not the abundant life that God has for his people. And Jesus, he's not offended by your mess, but he's not going to leave you there. He's not going to leave you there. He's going to change you. He's going to deal with you. He's going to sanctify. He's going to work in your life. Amen? Amen. Romans 8, 29 has become... You know, I, I hear people, uh, different, different people that I've heard maybe on the radio or, or uh, otherwise, and, and they, a lot of them say they've, they've had a verse, that they call it their life verse. You know, it's a verse that they've gone to over and over again throughout their life. Uh, it's almost been like a compass for them. When they begin to kind of lose their way, they go to this verse. And, and I've never really had that until just recently. There's, there's Romans 8, 29. There's, there's a part of that verse that has become different times I remind myself, this is my purpose. This is why I'm here. This is why I'm alive. And it says that we are predestinated, and I, I'm, I'm quoting here. I'm, I'm not, not word for word. But we're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's our purpose. That's your purpose this morning, to be conformed to the image of Christ. You're alive. You've been born again. But, but God is not satisfied with you just being alive. He wants to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. not going to conform you to the image of the brother or sister that's sitting beside you. There may be a lot of similarities. There may be a lot of things you have the same. But the standard... Jesus is that standard. He's going to conform you to his image. That's our purpose. Now, if you'll turn to me to Ephesians, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're talking about a life that overcomes. Ephesians chapter 4 beginning in verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off. Remember, we talked about the grave clothes that Lazarus had. Those things needed to be put off because those clothes said that he was dead, but Jesus had raised him, and so those things needed to be put off. And he says here, put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. How many of you know that when you were born again, the flesh did not get born again? The flesh, when I wake up in the morning, I find that the flesh is still the same old, dirty, rotten thing that it was when I went to bed. The flesh did not get born again. The flesh did not get saved. And God says, what do we do with it? It causes us trouble, doesn't it? So many times, the majority of our trouble is, is maybe not so much the devil, not so much other people, but so many times the majority of our problems and the things that we face when it comes down to it is just simply the flesh, the old man, the old nature that, that's continually trying to pull down this, this new life that is within us. What's the answer to that? Run and get counseling? He says, put it off. Put it off. And I'm, I'm not against counseling, but it better lead you to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He says, put it off. This thing that, that gives you so much trouble, put it off. It doesn't belong on you. As a child of God, it doesn't belong on you. Put it off. I, some, some time ago, some years ago, we were dealing with a situation and some things that we were trying to find direction and the Lord was dealing with, with an individual and, and, and it, was, it was not easy for them. It was difficult. And they made the comment, they said, you know, they don't know what it is. Everywhere they go, they've got the same problem. And that was very revealing to me. Because I thought, you know what? Everywhere you go, you take yourself with you. And so everywhere you go, you have the same problem. Could it be that there's something that needs to be laid down? Something that you need to just put off? Because no matter where you go, you take yourself with you. You take yourself with you. You can think, oh, if I, just, if I was just in this church, if, if, if the church would just be like this, then everything would be fine. I could live my Christian life. I could love my brothers and sisters. It would be so wonderful, so awesome. Would it really? If I just lived in this place, if I just lived in Sugar Creek instead of Millersburg, then things would get better. If I just had this house, if I just had this or that, Brothers and sisters, no matter, change what you want. You take yourself with you, and until you, are, 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 until you reckon yourself to be dead to that, you're going to have the same problems over and over and over again because the flesh did not get born again. But there is an answer to that flesh, and it is you reckon it to be dead. You reckon it to be dead. I spent a lot of time my young Christian life, trying to crucify this flesh, trying to put down this old man. But oh, the freedom, the day that I realized Jesus already did that. And now what I have to do is reckon on what he did. It's not up to me to put it to death. It's up to me to reckon on the work of Christ. Because he, when Jesus came, he took all of that old nature, gathered it up in himself, took it to the cross, and the Bible says that we were crucified with him. And then it says we were buried with him in baptism, and then we were raised again to a newness of life. And it didn't stop there. It says we're seated together with him in heavenly places. That's our position in Christ. We need to reckon on it. We need to recognize it. And so when the devil comes with the temptation to gossip about your neighbor. He comes with a temptation to look at something you shouldn't look at. You reckon on what Christ did. You say, no, I'm dead. That life is dead. Amen. Amen. I'm not sure where I was going with that. But he says, put it off. Put these things off. Because no matter where you go, you take yourself with you. And so you, it, it's our responsibility to put it off. I would love if God would send an angel sometimes and do that for me. But no, God says, you do it. You do it. You put it off. Amen. Now, when God created Adam, he created him as a spiritual being. And God being a spirit created a man, created a spiritual being that could have fellowship with him. Like I said earlier, God would come to Adam in the cool of the day and walk with him. Adam was a spiritual being that knew God and that walked with God, had spiritual fellowship with him. But when Adam partook of that forbidden fruit, when he, when he took that, and he sinned against God, something changed. He became an altogether different person than what God had created him to be. He became a man that was totally different. Instead of a spiritual man, with his spirit having control over his soul and body, now the self-life gained control. Now he became a man. His spirit had sunk down in control to his self-life. That's what happened in the fall. And so for thousands of years, man on the earth walked in the flesh, until the time where it was possible for him to be born again. I'm so thankful for that. 
until the time came when, when man could be born again and become again a spiritual man. That's what it means to be born again. Because in the fall of man, our spirit, the, the spirit of man became subject to, the, to his soul, and now the soul of man is, is what takes over and what has the control. But when you and I are born again, we become again a spiritual being that's able to fellowship again with God. And once again, our spirit then, God means and intends for our spirit now to rule over this body, over this flesh, over this soul. That in the fullness of time, Jesus came and he walked this earth as a man, flesh and blood, as a man full of the Holy Ghost. He was fully God and he was fully man. Not half God, not half man, but fully God and fully man. That's who Jesus was. And his life on this earth was the life of a man that was full of the Holy Spirit. That's how he lived. As the Son of God, he never had a beginning. But as the Son of Man, the Bible says he's the firstborn of a new creation. He's the firstborn of a new race, of a new life. He's the firstborn as the Son of Man. That's who Jesus is. He's the firstborn of that new creation. And when we become new creatures, when, when we become born again, we're, we, we take on that nature, the, the nature that Jesus brought forth as the firstborn of that new race. We take on that nature. That's who we become. And so now we're going to read further. He told us to put off the old man, put off that former conversation. Now in verse 23, and he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man. Now, who is this new man? Let's look at how he describes him. Which after God is created how? In righteousness and true holiness. This is how God describes that new creature that is in you. After God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And that's what you and I are to put on. See, we're not just to put off things. We're not, we're not just to put off things. You, you can try so hard to put things off. I can't do that. i got to put it off. But that's only half of the answer. The rest of it is you put on Christ. You put on this new man. You put on this new nature that you have of God. And see, the, the, the whole thing of separation... You know, we hear a lot about separation. We're a separated people. We're different from the world. We're to live different. We're to talk different. We're to be different. But for that to happen the way God intends for it to happen, our separation is not only separated from something, but we're also separated unto something. If our separation is nothing more than trying to stay away from the things of the world, then we're missing something. In Romans 1, Paul said he was separated not from the world, which he was. But he says like this, he says, separated unto the gospel of God. And if our separation is merely trying to stay away from the world, brothers and sisters, I feel sorry for you. Because there's so much more. Our separation, I've not only been redeemed from sin, I've not only been redeemed from that, but I've redeemed, been redeemed unto holiness. I've been redeemed unto a life of righteousness. I've been redeemed unto a life of power and unto a life of victory. My separation is not just from the world, but my separation is unto God. It's very important that we understand that. Many people try to be separated from the world and yet fail because they're in their separation, they're not separated unto God. And when you try to live separated from the world without being separated unto God, there's no power. There's no power. There's no overcoming life. And so we live that life separated unto God. That's the life that overcomes. A life that's separated unto God. And so he goes on. He says now in verse 25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. 
Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And so we see here, we see the expressions of the old man, the old nature. We see the expressions of that, what comes out of that. You know, it, it, it can look, you can dress up the old man. You can make him look pretty good. And when I say dress up, I'm not just talking about clothes. I'm talking about even in, in actions and in deeds. You can dress him up. But when John the Baptist came out of the wilderness preaching that message of repentance, and the Pharisees came to him, he told them something. He says, the axe must be laid to the root of the tree. He didn't say, you, you know, dress the tree up, make it look good. No, no, that tree is unacceptable. No matter how you dress it up, no matter how you make it look, it's unacceptable. That thing has to, the, the axe has to be laid to the root. And that's how it is with our old nature. It has to be, there, there, there's a death that has to take, there's a death that has taken place and you and I need to reckon on that. We need, to, we need to acknowledge that. And through that, we put him off. He's not asking you to put off the old man in your own strength. He said, reckon on what I did to him. You reckon on that. You put him off. And then you put on. We see the expressions and the life of that new creation. That's what God wants to... That's what he wants to be the expression of my life and your life, is this new creature, this new man. We become new creatures when we're born of the Spirit, and it is the development of that new creation that will bring us to the image of Christ. You walk according to that new life that you have been given, and one day you will awake in His likeness. One day you will awake in His likeness. There's many times I tell God, I say, Lord, I'm still... I, yeah, I've become a little more like you, I believe, but I'm still so far from what you are. But brothers and sisters, one day we will awake in His likeness because we're going to see Him as He is and we're going to be changed. Hallelujah. But it's the development of this new creature, this new life that's going to bring us to the image of Christ. And that's, what, that, that's the meaning of sanctification. The development of that new life. That's what sanctifies us. So every day I have a choice. Am I going to live in myself? Am I going to let the old man express himself? Or am I going to live in God? It comes down to that. If I live in myself, I'm going to be defeated. If I live in myself, I'm not going to overcome. I can, I can act pretty good. I can act pretty religious. You know, we have a, a young man recently born again, 25 years old, in the congregation in Heron there in Montana. It's a very powerful testimony. He grew up in a very religious home. He said, our family, we looked right. To the outside, everybody looking at us, to them we looked like a very wonderful family. He said, we were a mess. He said, our home was a wreck. It was a mess. And it so embittered him. He grew up and it so embittered him because he said, there can't be anything to this Christianity. What I've seen and what we claim to be, there's no way that there's anything to this thing. And he went out and he just, he, he lived a life of sin. It turned him to a life of sin, drugs, alcohol. It was horrible. He made such a mess, such a wreck of his life. And finally, he, he just said that, you know, life is not worth living. Uh, I'm going to end it. I take full responsibility for what I've done, for where I'm at. I'm going to end it. He said, God, 
If you're there, you better do something because I'm getting ready to end it. And he literally, he had his hand on the trigger starting to pull and all of a sudden God intervened. And he says, I don't even know how it happened. He said, the next thing I knew, I'm laying there and I'm alive. And, I'm, I'm, and his, first, his first reaction was anger. He was mad. Why, God, why am I still here? And the Spirit of God spoke to his heart and he said, if you're done with your life, then give it to me because I want it. The man got saved, born again. He's, he's, he's a young Christian, loves the Lord, spared by the mercy of God. But, but his family, they, they looked right. Everything was good. Everything was right. The tree was dressed nice. The brothers and sisters are not enough just to dress the tree up. Our source of life has to change. So every day I have a choice. Am I going to stay in myself? Or am I going to stay in God? When a situation presents itself to me, where I'm tempted to respond in the flesh, I have a choice. Am I going to respond in the flesh? Or am I going to respond by this new creature? And if you're like me, if somebody challenges with me with something, I have to say something back. That's just who I am. I have to. <laughs> I have to. But you know what I've learned? That sometimes it's just better not to. It takes sometimes more of the Holy Ghost to just be quiet than it does to say something. Don't, you know what? Stay on high ground with the enemy. Don't let him drag you off into a corner, into a debate, because he's going to win. I've been there. Believe me, I've been there. I've, I've been sucked into that thing, and all of a sudden I'm in a corner, and I don't know what to do. Stay on high ground with the enemy. Keep your focus on Christ. Don't let him take you into a little corner and start debating and arguing because you won't win. But we have that choice every day. Am I going to walk in myself? Am I going to live in myself? Or am I going to live in God? And brothers and sisters, I have found, and I believe according to the Bible, it's true that if I make the choice, God's going to back it up. If I make the choice to reckon on the work of Christ. No, I'm not going to let this flesh have any expression. I'm going to walk in, the, in this new life. I believe God backs up that new creation, and God brings the grace. God brings the strength. I've experienced it when I felt so uninspired and so unspiritual, but I made the choice, and God came with His strength and His grace, and He backed it up, and I was able to walk where God wanted me to walk. You know, so many times we want God to bring the grace first. God, I want to feel the strength. I want to feel the grace. And then I'll, then, I'll, then I'll respond the right way. You know, we want to see the walls of Jericho come down before we yell the vic shout the victory. And we want to see some cracks first. I want to see some evidence of this thing going to come down before I start to holler and yell the victory because obviously I don't have it yet. God said, no, you shout first and then the walls will come down. Many times you make the decision to do what's right. You make the decision to reckon on, on what Christ did, reckon that body to be dead to sin, and then reckon it to be alive to God. God will come. He backs up his new creation every time. Walking, living in this new creature, that's the life that overcomes. How many of you... You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you have ever tried to have faith? You've tried to believe. You've tried to have faith. Oh, that's miserable. You try and try and try to believe. Try and try to have faith. You know what, brothers and sisters? That new creature, that new creation has faith. You don't have to pump up the new creation with faith. The new man has faith. There's no unbelief in that new creation. Jesus, when, he took, when, when, when that life came into Mary, Mary come from a lineage, I've already been amazed 
You read of, of the lineage of Mary and Joseph and some of the people that are in there did some horrible things, awful things. I mean, murderers, prostitutes. I mean, you, you name it. It was, it was in that lineage. But when Jesus, when the life of Christ came into Mary, none of the pollution of that old nature came into that life. That life was sinless. That life was perfect. That life was holy and righteous. And none of the pollution of that old man came into that. And brothers and sisters, the new creation in Christ Jesus, none of the pollution or the filth of this world is in that new creation. That new creature in Christ, we read it here, after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So the new creation doesn't have to try to have faith. That new man has faith. There's no unbelief in that new man. There's no unforgiveness in that new creature. There's no bitterness in that new creation. There's none of that. There's no covetousness. There's no lust in that new man. That man is created after God in righteousness and holiness, just like the life of Christ. There was none of the pollution of the old nature got into his life. Even though Mary and Joseph came from a long lineage, of, of people who lived in sin, but none of that touched the life of Christ. And brothers and sisters, if we fail, if we sin, it's not because the new creature somehow messed up. It's because I walked in the flesh. It's because I, I gave the flesh expression. I didn't put off the old man. So what's the answer? Recently I was talking with somebody and they said, you know, I just have, I have a problem with unforgiveness. I just, I, I think, sometimes I think of, of what's been done, and I just, I just said, are you born again? Yes. I said, so Christ is in you. you you're a new creature. You have a new creation. And there's no unforgiveness in that new creature. You walk by that and you'll be free from unforgiveness. You reckon the flesh that wants to not forgive, this old nature that doesn't want to forgive, you reckon on what Christ did, put it down, you'll be free from unforgiveness. Because there's none of that in the new creation. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? But that's, the gospel works best that way. Complicated and it doesn't work so well. Keep it simple and it works wonderfully the way God intended it to. There's no unforgiveness in that new man. So if you're here today and you're battling with unforgiveness towards a brother, towards a sister, put it off. The Bible says you put it off. There's recently a man that came to me and, and, and you know, he's a brother in the Lord, but some of the things he was telling me, I said, you know, I just can't agree with you because, you know, if, if everything in my life, if there's something in my life that's a work of the flesh, there's, there's an answer to that, and that's the cross. I have to die to it. I have to die to it. I have to reckon it to be dead. So if, if, if you have a problem today, if you're sitting here, and not just unforgiveness. I don't know why I'm, I keep saying that. It, I guess, but anything in your life, if, if there's something there that just keeps hindering you, if you're born again, you can put it off. God would never tell us to do something if we are not able to do it. Amen? God would never give us a command in His Word if He doesn't also make the provision for us to do it. And so if He says put it off, we can put it off. Not on our own strength, but if you're born again, the life of Christ is in you, then you can do it. You can put it off. You can put on the new man, the new creature. And so there's none of that in that new creation. It needs to be put off. And I believe if the church, and when I, again, when I say church, I don't just mean this group. I mean collectively. If we would get back, if the church would get back to preaching the simplicity of this, the new creature, and our, our ministry, and all our efforts would, would be focused on speaking to that new creature, I believe many counseling and deliverance ministries would be out of business. 
you're quiet. And again, I'm, all, I, I'm not against counseling. I'm not against someone needing deliverance, but it better bring you to Christ because only in Him are you going to find freedom and deliverance. I see you have some plants here. Are these real or not? Well, we're going to pretend that they are. You know, you take a plant. You take one of these here, any of these up here. You look at them. Their color. The way they're shaped. All of that. Nobody came along, and I know in this case they did, because if they're not real, somebody had to make it that way. But, but let's say this plant is real. You see the shape. You see the color. I see some variety here. I see... A little bit lighter over here, a little darker here. Some of these are a little longer than others. All of that. You find a plant like this that's living. Nobody did that. Nobody came and painted that. Nobody came and made that, the shape it's in. It grew into what that was. How did that happen? It happened with a seed. So everything that that plan is today was in the seed, right? Everything will produce after its kind. You plant corn, what do you think is going to come up? Corn, right? You plant potatoes, potatoes are going to come up. How many of you, when you planted your gardens this spring, you went out and you planted pea seeds in the ground and you said I can't wait till those tomatoes ripen no you know it's going to be peas because everything is going to produce after its kind so the plant here everything that you see here the shape the color the size all of that is in the seed brothers and sisters the bible tells me in first peter 1 23 that I'm born again that you're born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible there's a seed that is in us that cannot pass away, that won't pass away. It's eternal. And everything that Christ is, that potential is within me because I have the seed of Christ. The Bible says, as He is. Not as He was, but as He is, so are we in this world. How is that possible? Because I have the seed of Christ in me. And everything that Christ is, if that seed grows, if that seed develops, it will produce everything that Christ is. Amen? And so it comes down to our battle, our struggle so many times. Yes, we do face the devil because you know what? If you want to walk in the flesh, believe me, the devil's going to give you lots of opportunities. He's going to promote that. He's going to push that. He's going to drive that. But so many times our struggle, it comes down to one or the other is going to live in me. One life or the other is going to live in me. The Bible says... You cannot get sweet and bitter water from the same fountain. So one or the other is going to live. Either Christ is going to live in me, either that new creation is going to live in me, either that seed is going to grow and develop in me, or the old nature is going to express and live through me. It can't be both. And so it comes down to which is going to live, whichever one that I feed. I know this is not new to you. I know you know this. But I find sometimes it's so good to be reminded, to be brought back to, those, to the simplicity of the gospel. It comes down to one or the other is going to live today in my life. Either I'm going to live according to the flesh or I'm going to live according to the new nature, the Spirit of God. And the one I feed is the one that's going to live. How do I feed that new man? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. I'm spending more time in this. I'm not, I'm not saying this to beat anyone over. I'm talking to myself as much as anybody. Ask my family. They know if I spend more time on my smartphone than I do in the Word of God, then it's very likely that this, create, this new creation is not going to grow, not going to live. 
We don't live by bread alone. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, prayer, communion, fellowship with God, that's what lifts up this new creation. You know, that's the purpose of fasting. Not so that we can earn brownie points with God and somehow earn favor with Him. Fasting puts down that old nature. At the same time, when you pray, it lifts up that new man. It lifts up that new man. So how do we feed this new life? Prayer, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. All of these things that God has told us in his word, this is how we feed that new man. And the one you feed is the one that's going to live, the one that's going to prosper, and the one that's going to grow. Feed the flesh, and the flesh is going to take over. Feed the spiritual man, and that spiritual man is going to rise up. And you're going to have a life of overcoming a life of victory. This is not just something, brothers and sisters, that I've learned as knowledge. This is something I've experienced, but I'm not done. I know that. I've not arrived. I haven't heard the Lord say, well done yet. I'm still, I'm still struggling. There's times I still fail. Many times I have to come to God. God, forgive me. God, forgive me for, for the way I respond. You know, that, that's what conviction is all about. We talk a lot about having conviction. I remember years ago in our youth group in, in Montana, a young lady, and she told me, or she was sharing with, with the other youth, new, new believer, and she said she's found herself that she was, she was able very easily to talk, again, to, to talk about other people. It was just easy for her to to run other people down. And she said, I, I came to God with this, and I began to ask him, Lord, put a guard on my lips. Put a door on my mouth that I not speak what I ought not speak. And as she shared that testimony, all of a sudden she began to cry, and the tears began to flow, and she said, you know what? Now, when I open my mouth, and I'm tempted to say something that I shouldn't say, there's a deep grieving that happens in my heart. A deep grieving and a sadness. And she said, I know God is telling me I don't want you to say that. That's conviction, brothers and sisters. Conviction is way more than just knowing what's right and wrong. It's something that God writes on your heart. Something that God puts deep in your heart. The more you live by that, and the more you walk by that new creation, that new creature, the more you're going to be like Jesus, the more you're going to be created in that image and likeness of Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is the life that overcomes. You can maybe overcome for a little bit in the flesh. The flesh has a little bit of strength, sometimes a lot, but God knows how to bring it down and to just show us again, you know what, it's all, it all comes back to it's in Christ. It's in Him. Brother Steve, I'm going to turn it back over to you at this time.